welcome to The Digital Patient, where we discuss the latest advancements in digital patient engagement and share stories from the front lines. I'm your host, Alan Sardana, and with me as always is Seamless MD CEO, Dr. Joshua Liu. Today, we were joined by our very special guest, Dr. Andrew Watson. Dr. Watson is a practicing colorectal surgeon and VP of Clinical Information Technology Transformation at UPMC. He is a renowned expert in the field of digital health with a focus on applying technology to deliver high quality patient-centered care. Dr. Watson blends his career working for all four UPMC business units, international, insurance services, enterprises, and health services divisions to practice and help envision the transformation of healthcare with a focus on telemedicine. Dr. Watson is also a past president of the American Telemedicine Association and is currently an advisor to the American Board of Telehealth. Dr. Watson, Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks. Sounds like we got you all choked up in that bio. I'm honored. It's awesome to have you on the show today. You know, you've led such a fascinating career, Andrew. Following in the footsteps of a very long and proud tradition of medical service, I believe you're the fourth generation surgeon in the family. I was really curious, you know, to begin the conversation, how did growing up in your family really shape your perspectives on medicine? Well, thank you for having me here up front. And, um, I just am genetically uh, predisposed to be a surgeon, I guess. But it does give you a sense of duty to others, which is important, and service. You know, regardless of time and weather and holidays and birthdays, I mean, you've got to go do this and help take care of others. And just a sense of doing what's right, which I think is very important, especially in the current environment in which we live in. I was very lucky to come in a, from a family with people that were truly role models and also belief in change, a lot of change. And when I was growing up, my father started the department of surgery with several others here at UPMC and also hired Tom Starzl, who was Dr. Starzl, who invented the liver transplant and see a lot of change at the dinner table and makes you realize how important that is and also how hard it is. So Dr. Watson, you know, you've been a, a pioneer in digital health in many ways. I mean, I feel like we've only started talking about digital health in the last five or six years, really, but you've been leading the way with telemedicine and telehealth since as early as 2006 and had the foresight to help shape healthcare in this direction. What got you into that in the first place way back in 2006? I have a brother who was a dot commer, and it was seeing him in our basement with a startup, and I think they were VT320s, those Orrin Hayes screens they used to have and looking at how he interacted with nursing homes gave me some exposure to digital health but also just maybe it's hardwired in me just being a geek <laughs> timing whatever but understanding that consumer electronics are a very strong part of who we are now it is actually who we are and i was lucky just to have a family that embraced electronics and digital and and believed in it. And I, uh, at times I think is a little much, but I was exposed early in my career to digital per se, which then made me realize that there's much more we can do with this than just, you know, connecting a few consoles or playing a few video games. And it, it took off from there, a little bit of accident of timing, but it's a, it's an exciting world to be in digital health. It absolutely is. And I'm just curious, like way back in 2006, I'm, I'm guessing not only is the technology not as mature, but maybe the reimbursement models and the incentives were not quite where they are today. Did you face a lot of pushback back then or, or were, were you doing this for free? I can't quite remember what the incentives were even back then, 2006. Well, part of what drove me was that the patients had to travel and Pennsylvania is a very rural state. We are one of the most rural after states such as North Carolina and Texas. And it just didn't make sense to have septuagenarians and octogenarians driving to look at some wounds and saying, are you eating? So by, there had to be a better way to do this and stumbled into some of it. We had a stroke network that was up and going and were able to parasitize part of that for our needs, but and we were getting reimbursed for it, but for us surgeons, we're less worried about reimbursement for the video visit than we are for the actual surgery. But I don't really look at patients as, as money, but I think a lot of folks realize that it's the surgery that matters, not the video visit. So I was a little bit less focused on that. And 
you know, patients would tell you, like, I just drove. What started me was a lady came to my clinic after a fairly routine Crohn's surgery, which I do a lot of, and said, Doc, I love you, and gave me a hug. And I, I clown around with my patients. I'm pretty easygoing. But I asked her, like, three questions. Are you eating? How am I off? Are you moving your bowels? Let me see your wound. And she said, I love you, but I, my house, the backyard of my house touches one of your hospital's properties. Like, I could climb over the fence. And I just drove an hour and a half for those three questions. I'm like, ah, I get it. So we can start using video. So she pointed out the side effects of travel. And, you know, we're so focused on quality and side effects in medicine. The side effects of travel are enormous. And that's what opened my eyes to the travel as being or can be injurious. Yes, it gives you access, but there's a downside from a health, quality of life, and economic standpoint. Yeah. And actually, Andrew, you've shared your thoughts on this in the past. Telehealth being a natural evolution of healthcare that is primarily shaped by consumers. Can you unpack that idea for us and maybe share more on why you believe that digital tools can really help bring the humanity back to healthcare? Sure. The It's kind of a unpleasant way to remember these stocks, and I'll be apolitical here, but if you think of the MAGA stocks, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, those stocks have all been evaluated at over, um, or evaluated at over a trillion dollars. And that's more than the entire budget of countries like France and Britain. And so healthcare physicians are not gonna be able to say no to those folks. These are some of the largest driving forces in the world are these tech stocks. And our country, has evolved and society has. We used to work in farms and now there's no more farms and we went to the factories. And then, you know, after the nuclear era, I mean, we lived in an entirely different world. And so we've gone through these incredible changes through a couple generations, but now we're in the digital era. And the problem is the digital era, A, there was no grand opening for this thing. Um, there wasn't a warhead that went off. There wasn't a factory you could smell we sort of slid into this thing sideways. But it's changed us forever as a species. And I don't say that lightly. And what's driving us is an interest from us as human beings, but also from a big money standpoint. And so we as individuals live and breathe technology. And I just rhetorically say to people, when's the last time you left your cell phone at home? And if you've got a watch, a tablet, and a phone, you've got three cellular signals with you. You know, and I was driving to work one day and I had this ridiculous 650 horsepower car. I had a drone in my back seat and I had a self-driving car parked beside me on the road. Like, wow, what a world we live in. And so we are as consumers or patients and others are being led in a good way by technology. And a lot of this is driven by money, but it, Technology and these companies are teaching us how to look at video screens like we're doing now, do speech recognition, and use phones and type and use them to monitor data, and that's healthcare. So we just took what technology is teaching us, like during the filming of this podcast, and we just turned it right into healthcare. So we didn't have to teach patients how to like pick up a phone and turn on a video oh. and talk to it. That's all done for us. So this all came preloaded, which is great. And you know, once patients get this, it's not that hard to figure out. And it's much more humane doing healthcare at home. Like when you get sick, what's your instinct? <laughs> your instinct's not to run and drive in a car and pay for McDonald's and hit a pothole and look for toll booths. I mean, you curl up on your couch at home. And so this ability to use this technology and digital to take care of patients at home is just humane. And it's not for everybody, but it's for a lot of folks. And I, I don't think we really know how to use it fully yet, but we're getting there. We're making yeah. some some headway. Definitely. Maybe you could tee on something you mentioned earlier a bit about, um, you talked about incentives a bit earlier. You know, most telehealth is, is fee-for-service, and, and you mentioned in the past how value-based care in many ways is a better fit for telehealth so that providers are less focused on, you know, each load activity and, and more focused on using telehealth to improve an, an outcome for a patient. 
Do you feel that any payer or provider has really figured this out yet? And, and where does value-based care need to go from here so that telehealth actually is being used to, to improve patient outcomes? Many of the payer providers are looking at this, including UPMC, where I work. You know, the largest ones in the country, obviously the VA is one. Kaiser, a lot of respect for them. Intermountain, UPMC. And so in Intermountain and UPMC are very similar, a couple of clicks behind Kaiser. All of those folks have a good sense of this, and it's a it's a very exciting time. And obviously, the VA does. The VA's got a slightly different model because they're not under the some of the OPEX and CAPEX constraints that we are in our companies. And I'm not saying they aren't under any financial constraints. No, it's just their access to capital is different than ours. And so those systems are all looking at, and we're seeing folks like Optum now, obviously, on the payer side, through United, of course, are also entering into this payer provider space and 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 people fundamentally get this. I think the challenge that we have right now is how do we operationalize it? And so as a surgeon, you could not use open surgery instruments and techniques to do laparoscopic surgery. So we had to rebuild our operational models for laparoscopy using ports to get in using sticks with heating and staplers. And we didn't do any of this stuff when I was training in the late 90s. And I sound like an old bag, but you know, we didn't do any of this. We had to rebuild ORs, operational models, instrumentation, thought processes, dissection planes. And so with telemedicine, we didn't do that. We just reached over the table and picked up an operational workflow from face to face, like, there you go. And I think that's hurting us. I don't think that's wise. But so that's why you're not seeing more of it. And then to answer your part about value is that if we're incentivizing us to see patients on increments of time based in an EHR that, that, that works and for the most part, and we need to recalibrate people's understanding of tele. Tele is not replacing a face-to-face -face with a video visit. That's the easiest way to do it. It's the quick and dirty, but really but it's not the way to think of it. In a value-based model, I say, you know, hey, you get X amount PM, PM to take care of Josh. You'd say, well, I'll see him like a couple of days a week after discharge just for like three or four minutes using video. And I'm not trying to drop a bill or code for it in some specific fashion. I'm just checking in quickly. And that's why I think value by refocusing, like we will use any legal and compliant means to see patients, be it monitoring be it video, be it secure texting, to ensure your health and wellness or your post-acute setting is going well, it's a very important way for us to recalibrate our model and value will drive that. It's too hard to get caught up in codes right now, in my opinion. Uh -huh. Too confusing between especially third-party payers. Yeah, definitely. It, it, it sounds like a, you know, a pretty big paradigm shift to go from you know, mostly in person to a little bit of like video to to your point, which and I think in an ideal world, we're using our best judgment to determine what is the most appropriate form of communication or care. And, and in some cases, it might just be a telephone call, and others it might be video or it might be face to face. And and to your point, it seems very difficult to operationalize. Do you think we end up getting to a point where instead of leaving it to an individual's best judgment because it's so new that we start having directives around, you know, what best practice ends up being three asynchronous or video visits post-op like three times over the next two weeks or something like that? Or or do you think it's it's reasonable for us to leave it up to individuals' judgments, even though we've never done it before, it's a paradigm shift? I'm trying to figure out how do you operationalize this to a better place? We're, we're in a very early learning phase of digital, and it's funny how healthcare hops around these terms, big data, EHRs, RIOs, HEs, high-tech telemedicine, telecare, e-care, e-health, you know, we hotspot, bright, shiny objects. But I think right now, to get tele truly going, we need to pick the key clinical use cases and pathways and be a bit more prescriptive. If you look at the big innovations that we've seen lately, aside from EHRs, if you look at laparoscopy and transplantation are big ones, and now we're really getting into pharma and biologics. These were focused solutions for problems with focused workflows around them. And we need to stick to what we know how to do is to solve discrete problems. So I think 
for post-acute, yes, ideally there'd be monitoring with AI interpretation to see who needs the video and who doesn't. Because video is expensive. It's one-to-one. -one. We all got to be here together. And it's expensive to do video. We don't have enough staff right now to even take care of face-to-face. -face. So there has to be ways to, there has to be a way to be smarter. And I think we can use combinations of monitoring and video and chatbots to do that and to create almost like a teletriage overlay of healthcare. Yeah, I love that. Andrew, I was curious, you know, pre-COVID telemedicine was very underutilized uh, compared to obviously where it is today. Although your program was one of the pioneers, you were using it. But at the start of the pandemic, telemedicine spiked across the board. Every system had virtual visits or, or video visits set up pretty quickly. Since then, there's been a bit of a pullback on telemedicine use, still higher than pre-COVID levels, but nowhere near where it was at the beginning of the pandemic. Presumably, we've learned a lot about telemedicine over just this two-year period. We know when it's more appropriate, when it's maybe less appropriate, and now we have have some encounters that have gone back to in-person. Where does telemedicine fit within the workflow over the next 10 years? How do you see it playing out? What are some of the tailwinds or headwinds that you foresee? Well, if it's spiked, that's a good pun, right? Because of the old spike protein there, so that's good. <laughs> it's We've had two conversations or three internal conversations about this today. Very few innovations in healthcare have gone up and down like tele. Usually it's up and up and up and up and up. Now COVID, everything is nonlinear in that capacity in that time where we had such medical pressure and societal pressure, we had to use it. It's all we had. But the, ref the regression to or return to, a, choose a less pejorative term, to like 10 to 15% of all visits being done with tele is not so good. And that to me reflects the middleware piece or the operational model I was rambling on about a bit earlier where we really are using the wrong workflow for tele and just throwing a piece of technology at a phone and a, I mean, at a patient and a doc and saying, have at it, it's not going to work because I'm not the genius bar. I was trying to round on a patient prior to this podcast and I spent 20 minutes fixing the technology. Yeah. So in the time I should have seen the patient, I'm actually probably going to miss the patient now before they go home. It's fine. And it just, things happen. And the fault probably was mine for having to upgrade my computer. But there's an example of just and that that's endemic to all tele. It's not a UPMC issue. So how do we, it's not like when I walk into the OR at misfires. I don't think I've canceled a case in five years at UPMC. And I do very sick cases with these salvage Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So how do we get tele functioning on the level of the ORs where these highly complex dynamic environments that are taking care of sick patients and sometimes healthy patients, relatively speaking, work every time. When I go in the OR, it works. And so, and I give UPMC a lot of credit for running these ORs. It's hard. But tell us got to start hitting those SLA terms. And, but we first need to start looking at it and dissect out the technology to say, why is it so hard? So I don't know. We'll see what happens over time. But that's why I think this middleware between your desired individual, be it a member or a customer I don't really like, but a member, a patient, a wellness visit, an employee, and some type of physician, nurse, or other provider, all that stuff in the middle, that's where it is. It's just not sexy to look in there. It's like if your car was made of, made of plexiglass, you could see your differential and transmission in your camshaft, it would probably confuse you, but you sure want it to work. Yeah. So it's that kind of a balance. The middleware is very important. That makes sense. I, I guess maybe another tail and I hope is in our favor is, you know, we should see increased broadband access for the internet across, you know, every state, every region. And maybe at some point it's going to be the norm where there is some device in every patient's home. So that does feel inevitable, even if nothing else changes at the very least. Like, as a question is how fast do we get there? And then to your point, what do you, what do, you do in the meantime? Um, uh, yeah, and you should, let me just add something. You reminded me, I, I am hugely optimistic. And I'm really excited. I, I just, every day gets better and better and better. We're going farther and farther. We're doing some really cool stuff here at UPMC that's 
I just, it's a great place for me to work and I, I enjoy what we're doing. This issue of lack of access to broadband will fade as will they're too old to use technology will fade. And we're already seeing those two issues fade. So that only adds to our zeal and optimism. Oh, sorry to interrupt you. No, no, that, that's wonderful. I mean, you're, you're clearly an optimist because, uh, you know, there aren't that many people back in 2006 who were doing this. So <laughs> I'm glad that optimism hasn't, hasn't left you. I think sometimes in healthcare, uh, we become more cynical, but it feels like at least in, in, in this topic, you've just become more of an optimist and you, you've uh, laid the path. So thank you for that. You know, I want to ask you, uh, actually, on a slightly different note, um, you know, we're, and I hope you don't mind, I'm going off schedule here, but because, you know, OpenAI, ChatGBT has come out, I'm sure you've been following Dr. Watson. I'm curious, because healthcare, I feel like the bar is much higher, the bar for safety, the bar for appropriate is much higher. It's not like, you know, marketing in a business where it's okay if, if, it, if you know, ChatGPT generates, you know, crappy outputs, it's okay if it's wrong, you can't really afford to be wrong in healthcare very often. So even though I think a lot of people in healthcare are getting excited about, you know, generative AI and chat GPT, realistically, any thoughts on, you know, when oh, any use cases that actually could be valuable and, and how soon do you think we actually could see that in healthcare on the care delivery side? Use cases in terms of those technologies specifically or something more general? Uh, chat GPT. And I see a lot of doctors talking online about, Hey, this is going to help me with some of my insurance documentation, maybe, or, you know, things like that. I'm curious if you actually believe there'll be an impact in the, even the next 24 months, even. I think there could be, we'll have to see how the regulatory environment reacts to this. It's a bit of a hard time to be, to grow up with all this political unrest and social unrest and, and medical unrest in our society. And Likewise, for technologies, you've got the PAG sort of in fits and starts moving along, and you have a lot of, it's not a lot, it's just a lack of clarity, but that has to do with the pandemic. It's not a condemnation of the government at all. It's just a matter of the, the era in which we live. So with the regulatory and policy landscape still settling down into a clear view, it's, I think any technology is on the book as long as it doesn't hurt patients and is compliant. We should try everything right now. I mean, healthcare's got a lot of catching up to do. It's one of my really good friends from Oxford was with me over the weekend, and I was from London, and we were laughing about mind the gap. If you look at the gap between the potential of consumer electronics in healthcare, it's enormous. So healthcare has a lot of catching up to do, but could also leverage that gap to advance its own case to better help people make itself more affordable. And I don't say the latter lightly. So we better try everything. We better look at everything. You know, I don't think we're going to get into the Terminator situation where artificial intelligence takes us over, but there's a lot we can learn from artificial intelligence and new ways of communicating. I love that. Andrew, I got to ask, you know, given your optimism that you've had, you're obviously met with a lot of skeptics as well. You get to hear the opposite view, especially pre-COVID. You were hearing a lot about the theoretical idea of supplier-induced demand. I think this theory was rendered obsolete over the past two years. Obviously, there was a clear need for telehealth. I'm curious, though, today, are you still met by any skepticism? Is there anything that comes to the forefront that is clearly a consideration that you're hearing out there of why telehealth might not be so successful? Anytime you change a culture like ours, is hard, and healthcare is no different. And you're going to get blowback. And I just remember, again, with my family of surgeons, there's a couple of big things that they were involved with, and it shaped the medical future a bit in Pittsburgh. And they got a lot of blowback. And you just, just got to keep going if you believe it, as long as it's you're doing what you believe is right and you can validate it, which we certainly have. Supply-induced demand, you hear a lot less of it these days, that's for sure, but it's still, tele hasn't been able to substantially decrease the cost of care, so supply-induced demand isn't entirely gone yet. But in terms of specific rifle shot issues and criticisms that we get, it's much more diffuse now. It's more like a blunderbuss. You get a little of this and a little of that, but the the net vector of negativity is a lot less. 
it's still there, but it's more diffuse than the usual things that people would say to you. Well, I don't like it, and it's hard to use, and patients don't want it. You get that right. stuff. You're going to get it. It's the same with laparoscopy. I mean, we were in 2003, same same types of comments. We were told it was bad for the patients, and now it's the standard of care. So it's just a group of really smart people that care. It's hard to change sometimes, especially quickly. But to clearly answer your question, the big push has abated significantly, not entirely, and the issues are much more diffuse. So there's nothing specific that's come out, such as, I will be sued. They can't use it. They're too old. So it's it's an amorphous foe, but it's a much smaller foe than we've had in the past, and that will autocorrect at some point. If something pops up, then we'll address it. Back in the day when you were growing up, did you routinely hear like your your father, for instance, doing house calls to patients? Was that the the standard of care back then? Yeah, I did some with him actually. We used to go to some houses, but he went with his father, and his father went with his yeah. father, and we're just part of part of the family tradition. And it's something that I wanted to do too, and it's basically what I do. Just mm-hmm. digit. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's so cool. Actually, now I'm curious. When's the last time you've heard or seen of a of a surgeon doing a a physical house call? Like, wh- when did that actually stop happening? Was that like decades ago, or, or I would say in the early '80s, people still do it, and they say rural physicians do it, and community physicians, yes. My dad, for certain patients, would certainly be doing it, and I offered to do one last week or two weeks ago, and I was actually going to go to the patient's house. But we actually had an ice storm, and it was negative seven degrees, and it was not even safe to get there. So I actually was going to go to their house, and the patient had actually never met. So, um, yeah, we're still trying to do it if you can. It's not common. <laughs> Unrelated, no. I mean, we, we've seen, I think, the news in the, in the recent you know weeks that the Hospital at Home initiative and the funding is going to continue for, for some time. Lots of great innovation happening with that model the last several years. I'm curious, any thoughts on how that might grow? Like, do you think there are certain maybe key use cases that we haven't explored for hospital at home that you think are, are going to emerge in the next few years, perhaps? Hospital home makes sense, and it's a evolution of home care and home visits. I think it would benefit a lot from monitoring, but it has to be monitoring with AI and an ER type mentality to the call center that's looking at the data. Looking at the raw data for monitoring, we realize here is kind of hard. Too much data, <laughs> kind of teasing out the signal noise. You can still do it. But if you have monitoring with hospital home, I think you can do a lot. And there's always the dragons of CHF and COPD are the big ones. Those are the ones where, you know, I'm dying, the derivative effects of diabetes create a lot of expense and problems. Um, but there are areas that we should look at, which are, I think, post acute care is a good one. Some of the top chronic diseases, that, the rare diseases, I do Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. They're extremely expensive based on the medical yeah. spend. So being able to control some of the pharma expense through hospital home is a good way to move the needle. So use cases you may not think of up front, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis psoriasis, things like that. But the the IBD ones are the ones, inflammatory bowel disease drive a lot of costs. So I think those types of use cases, the usual suspects, plus some of the high pharma spends are the ones to look at. Can I ask you, just on the topic of, you know, let's say remote monitoring of patients, you know, I, I think we're seeing, you know, in some cases, patients who are maybe being monitored by care teams that maybe don't necessarily have to be affiliated with the the provider group or the health system. But, you know, when it comes to surgical care, given that so much of what could happen in the acute period, let's say 30, 60 days out, might be related to the the index surgical, you know, admission, it feels like surgery might be a use case where the surgical team should be the one that's involved in any, you know, post-discharge monitoring. Do you think that that necessarily should always be the case? Or do you think we could ever get to a point where maybe there is specialization where, the surgical team focuses on surgery. There's a separate team that focuses on post-discharge care. Does that ever, would that ever make sense to you think, or should the surgical team own that whole episode? I would never say always anymore. Would... I made that mistake enough. So <laughs> I, uh, it's a good we point. were in a meeting here in Pittsburgh and the 
someone said there was just an earthquake i said we never have earthquakes in pittsburgh and then this <laughs> siren went off there was just an earthquake like okay lesson learned if tele gets pushed down enough which it will over time to the rank and files and others like me and where it's just a part of our daily lives yes we can monitor it but it'd have to be operationalized and getting back to that middleware again mm -hmm in a way that it's part of our mainstream workflow. But one of the biggest and most powerful use cases ever of tele will be tele-triage. And I think we're gonna create this ozone layer around healthcare of tele-triage where problems, uncertainty, patient requests, wellness data, we be filtered and reflected off this ozone layer using a tremendous amount of monitoring in targeted video to help understand what's actually happening outside of our four walls. And so I think we reach that point of the ozone and the teletriage, healthcare will then meaningfully leave hospitals and offices and enter the cloud. But it's gonna take that where then you're saying, well, I got a surgical referral, and they don't have to come to my office. I can meet them in the cloud, the anesthesia can meet them in the cloud. We can work them up, they can get the care locally, they just got to drive to Pittsburgh once, Good. just for the surgery. And when we achieve that layer of true teletriage with this ozone filtering things, uh, we've reached it. It's going to work. And I guess like the, the holy grail is at some point, you know, like we do want Dr. Watson involved, let's say, in that post-discharge episode of care, but only when we really need Dr. Watson. In every other case where we don't need his expertise, it, let's have someone else manage that so you can focus on the sickest, you know, most complex patients who need it. That, that's kind of the holy grail, I guess, if we can get there. Or you distribute my expertise where if a GI physician is scoping a patient in an outside hospital, why can't they just say, hey, you know, Watson, what do you think about this? Would you operate yeah. in this person or not? Or are there ways to use me farther than just a driving range or a local range where you could say, hey, you're getting into this other field of surgical telementoring where... I could help people fight fires. I mean, I'm, I'm good at Crohn's. I should be. I'm really good at it. I should be. I've been doing it for 25 years. And if someone's operating and they find it, they should say, hey, you know, Watson, what do you think? Then that's where you get into telementoring about you. This is what your options are. This is what you can do. You look at the surgical field. You look at the planes, the fibrosis, whatever it is, an abscess, and try to make decisions about what's best for the patient. So there's a lot of ways to distribute what we do using this new technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, at some point, we'll just be able to teleport you to any OR where your expertise is needed. Yeah. Yeah, we'll and have a hologram. Yeah. <laughs> An avatar, right. whatever it is these days. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. Well, Andrew, you know, we've chatted about a ton of different technologies. Obviously, this triage idea and this kind of ozone layer that you're suggesting is encompassing a lot of different areas of technology, telementoring, like you mentioned, and triaging and remote patient monitoring even fits in there. There is, at this point in time, an explosion of patient-facing innovation, whether it's chatbots or digital care journeys or remote patient monitoring. I'm really curious, what are you most excited about today? Isn't it all patient-facing innovation? Not to be a skeptic, I just, it's always funny how we always look for the latest, the next cliche or what can we add to our lexicon. It's all about the patient at some <laughs> point, be they well, be they ill. That's all that really matters. And so, sorry, that's where my skeptic comes in. <laughs> um, I feel that AI in the field of monitoring is the most exciting and most impactful. If digital works correctly, you would think that AI and monitoring would be about 80 to 90% of digital, in my opinion. And I guess at that point, to what you're saying earlier, that the critical piece is how do you make it fit in the workflow operationally? And I think what we, we, I keep being reminded of is technology at some point is, is the easy part. It's the human piece that's the hard part. And it, we're getting there, it feels like. We, we are getting better at it, but maybe not as quickly as we all like, but but we're getting there. Yep. Yeah. Just what well, we can do with it. Absolutely. A final question that I had, Andrew. I know at this point you've conducted over 800 teleconsults at this point with patients, maybe even more. I'm really curious, have you had a patient so far where the first time you met them was surgery face-to-face? -face? Yeah, I've done about 70 that way. In fact, wow. we're, we're instituting this right now. A bunch, yeah. 
Yeah, I scheduled well. actually in last week in clinic. I scheduled three that way. It's a new so world. It's, it's patients. It's really what they want, right. but it's not like I'm any different on the screen or in yeah. person. It's the same me. It just looks a little different. Yeah. And the opinions are the same and the judgments are same and the data is the same. Right. And a lot of it is how you conduct yourself, your style. Some like it, some don't. And hey, if they don't like it, come on in. Not not a problem. I'm here. So um, there's no pressure to do it this way. And I'm always here. And if they change their mind, come, ne come next Thursday well, in clinic. Not a big deal. Right. So we keep it pretty simple. I don't make a big deal of it. And um, yeah, I think it works well. Yeah, I like that. Giving the, the patient the choice. It makes a lot of sense. Very good. Well, Andrew, just being mindful of your time, let's flip over to what we call the fast five lightning round. This is just five quick questions to get to know you better. First question that we have is, what is your favorite book or book you've gifted the most? The Patrick O'Brien series, yeah. the Aubrey series, John Aubrey. Excellent. Question two, who is a person either dead or alive who you'd love to meet? Mr. Christopher Wren, Man. the architect who built St. Paul's. I actually wrote my thesis on it. We went to the same college. Very cool. Yeah. Over at Oxford. Question three, would you rather have super strength, super speed, or the ability to read people's minds? I think it'd be too scary to read minds. I want super strength and renovating my house. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Question four, what is something you know heavy cast iron is? Cast iron is really... <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Absolutely. A question four, what is something in healthcare you believe that others might find insane? The fact that People get paid for their complications. Yeah. It, it was funny, Dr. Watson, if we had asked you this question maybe 15 years ago, you might have said telehealth. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> or laparoscopy, who knows? That's yeah. right. Hearsay. Question five, if you could travel back in time to any event or moment, what would it be and why? Uh, the ratification of the Constitution, just to hear that incredible change in taking care of others and the sense of duty and trying to set this thing up correctly so it works in the future when we're long gone. Mm -hmm. uh, that's awesome. Well, excellent. Andrew, Dr. Watson, thank you again so much for your time on the show. You can find Andrew Watson on Twitter at ARWMD. Uh, and just a personal note for me, there is a lot of great education on that Twitter page. There's also a lot of really good humor, very, very highbrow humor on there. So go ahead and check that out. Uh, that's a wrap for this episode of The Digital Patient hosted by SeamlessMD. You can follow us on Twitter at SeamlessMD. And if you like the podcast and you want to learn more, visit www.seamless.md. Uh, Andrew, Dr. Watson, again, thank you so much for your time. Happy to be here. Thank you for asking me.